Dave Philitis, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. Executive producer Huck is here. She's doing good today. She's been having lots of fun running around in the yard with Angie. Yeah? Hey, can you shake? Oh, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. That's a good girl. She's got a bone in the other room, so she doesn't want to play around too much, so. She made her appearance, and she's gone. <laughs> Bye, Hawk. All right. So we're back. And there she goes. So uh, people were saying, hey, where's Huck been? Well, she's been around. And she's been having fun. She's been a good dog. Uh, probably the most fun is we have some pretty big snow drifts here. And Huck will run along at <coughs> warp factor five speed and just jump right into the middle of the snow. And then she'll walk along and just use the bottom of her mouth like a scoop, to scoop up some snow every once in a while. Then she'll just lay in it. And we went uh, hiking with her the other day up a trail that was just all snow. <laughs> her feet never get cold. <laughs> oh. Anyhow, this is a missing persons edition. Thanks for being here. And we've got uh, a couple of fascinating cases for you. And uh, I've got some letters for you that I've gotten over the last few days and some pretty interesting ones. First one, Dave. These are hard copy letters people sent. Really discovered you and in making my way through your work. I decided to see if the local library carried anything about yours. While my branch had nothing, a branch in a nearby city showed an extensive offering. When I attempted to actually order something, it turned out that every single book, save one, had been stolen. <laughs> An item not returned by the borrower. When I inquired why they only had one area in the library had anything by you, I was informed that each library manager determined what they would order for their branch. It is now my mission to go out to each library and make a direct request to the powers to be for you to be fully represented. Perhaps each of your followers could do the same. Let's bring you to the masses. Also, do you offer a library discount? So if a library gets a hold of us and they want a discount, we'll give them a discount. Uh, when I first started, we sent out 500 of the missing 411 Eastern books to libraries all across the US at my cost. And it's because I wanted to get the masses to get their hands on the book. Now, some libraries have a policy that they'll only purchase from this one organization. Yeah, and what that organization wants me to do is discount the books to them and them to make a profit. Nah, that dog don't hunt. Now, I will sell at a discount to the libraries, but you know, I'm not selling to this organization. Let me get to the actual reason that I'm writing. So, it's a long story short. <clears throat> if you go to a library that doesn't have the, our books, you go to the librarian and say, I want to make a request that the library carries this book. And that's how they get and make a decision about whose books they bring in. Okay, in about 1977, my husband, Dave, was a 20-year-old who lived in Ojai, California. In warm weather, he slept in a screened porch covered by visqueen. One night, he was awakened by the sound of footsteps on the gravel path leading to the house. He got up and cracked the door and looked outside. He was shocked to see two men dressed in black suits and ties and white shirts. Telepathically, one of them said, open the door and let us in. Dave was terrified and said, no. In response, he heard, you know, we will come in anyway, just open the door. Seemingly against his will, he opened the door and they came in and sat on the bed with Dave sitting between them. Dave was looking at the men in black on his right, whose lips never moved, but heard him say, we know you have been wondering if we are real. Dave said yes, and the men in black replied, we are real and we will come back and visit you again someday. They got up and walked out, but that was, there was no sound of footsteps on the ground. So Dave opened the door a few seconds later, and they had disappeared. 
So my question is, Dave, do men in black just come to introduce themselves and lay the groundwork for future visits? I thought they only showed up to warn a contactee to not say anything. My Dave has no memory of abduction or lost time or unusual bruises, etc. He refuses to be hypnotized, but has suffered from depression his entire life. He's intelligent, steady, and not prone to fancy. I found him to be absolutely honest in all things. I am a retired federal law enforcement officer and not prone to hysteria. Thank you for your time. Great questions. Great questions. When I was uh, first getting into the missing persons field, people came to be about me about these men in black. And I kind of discounted it. And the longer time's go, gone on, the more I've come to realize that it's something cross-dimensional, I guess. Uh, but she said something that was interesting, and that is when they got up and walked, their feet didn't make sound. Well, when you talk about the cryptid animals in the world, and even Bigfoot, a lot of people say they don't make sounds when they step either. So does that mean they're really not stepping on the ground? Just a thought, just a thought. And uh, got this letter from a deputy sheriff. Hey Dave, I'm enclosing a printout from Fox News about a topic that was discussed in the media here back in December. This is LA County. That you may find interesting. So I've spent a lot of time in LA during my life and it's only gotten progressively horrendous, horrendous in the last three years. When Ben was living there, he was living in a pretty nice area and weird things started to happen and Ben started to say, Dad, this area is even getting bad. Homelessness is bad. Crime is bad. Uh, the area is getting dangerous. And we talked a lot about uh, the L.A. County District Attorney, George Gascon. The reason we talked about him, because we both know him, because he came from San Francisco County. He was first the San Francisco Police Chief, and then he became the District Attorney of San Francisco. And that's how I know who Gascon is. But let me go on. I'm sure you would have talked about it by now, but... Uh, I haven't heard you discuss it yet with your audience, so I decided to share it with you in your village. The printed article is very brief, but a very informative interview on Fox News with Deputy District Attorney Eric Sadal made the late night news and was eye-opening. As you know, we here in LA County have a Soros-backed DA, George Gascon, who has wreaked havoc with our criminal justice system. The latest news which I attached is that he is no longer going to impose sentence enhancements on serious crimes, example, using a firearm during the commission of a robbery. Me being law enforcement, I care about this a lot. Even though I don't live in California, and I would never move back to California, I care about California because I have a lot of loved ones there. And I don't want to see the state go further downhill, even though I think it's impossible at this point. The letter goes on. Apparently, if an illegal alien suffers a conviction that has an added sentence enhance enhancement, it sets off an alarm at Department of Housing and DHS. The alien will be deported, while another alien who committed the same underlying felony without a sentence enhancement would not be deported. This creates a two-tier justice system here in L.A. County. Since an American citizen like you or me is going to face several more years in prison, than an illegal alien who did the exact same crime, Gascon's directive is inviting the illegals to use firearms more during the commission of crimes since they know there won't be any additional uh, charges filed. There's no deterrent for them anymore. I'm now 14 months away from retirement as a deputy sheriff. Cannot wait to leave this state where I've spent my whole life. Keep up the good work. Hope to meet you someday. Hope to meet you too, thanks. Here's the article. L.A. County D.A. Gascon issues directives to avoid adverse immigration consequences. Now, Dave, why are you reading this on a missing persons segment? Because I care about you guys. 
And I know LA County has notoriety for being a place you go on vacation with families and things. Don't. I'm telling you right now, don't. Don't go to Disneyland. Don't go to anywhere in LA, Anaheim area. It's too dangerous. I would never like to take my kids down there now. Not a chance. And this is why. Prosecutors in LA County will now have to weigh the effects charging decisions will have on immigration status of suspects and encouraged to seek diversion programs to help avoid deportation according to a new directive. The policy from DA George Gascon is another in a long list of progressive measures to overhaul how justice is sought in the nation's largest DA's office. According to the policy which was obtained by Fox News, alternatives to criminal convictions should be considered such as avoiding charging for criminal enhancements, which can significantly increase one's prison sentence. That would turn an otherwise immigration neutral offense into an immigration damaging offense. That's basically saying we're going to give you a pass because you used a gun, Eric Sadal, Vice President of the DA's Association at LA County. Under one criminal investigation, anyone under criminal investigation can contact the DA's office to present information concerning adverse immigration consequences before a case is filed, the measure states. The policy that has been formed, it all said, all charging determinations shall be undertaken with the goal of avoiding and mitigating adverse immigration consequences. Friends, I'm very troubled by this because I care about you. What about us? the victims, not the suspects that commit the crime. You're the victim. What about protecting our rights from those people that are doing harm? If there's no adverse effect to using a gun, why not use a gun if you're a criminal? And don't tell me they don't talk. And what Gascon is doing is he's going to make LA County even worse because it'll be a place you can go, use a gun, and you won't have adverse effects on your record. Very frustrated. But, back to missing people. Uh, a man named Paul sent me this. And Paul is a very talented guy, let me tell you. He made these wooden flags and these things to hang small art and a little elk. The man is a fantastic artist and I'm humbled to have these. And they're beautiful. It says, uh, to Dave Politis from Paul, defend the police. Awesome flag. Awesome work. Thank you. And then this family <laughs> sent this and this. This made me laugh. This is a good one. It says, uh, dear Dave, Angie, and Huck, as I sat here a couple days ago contemplating which Bigfoot friend I'd be sending you, I heard then that you saw a thinking a lady who sent these nice pull toys. Here's a contribution for to Huck's toy box. Discard the rawhide if you don't like it. Our Jack Russell Chihuahua mix is my toy tester. She's so smart, so sweet, so awesome. And you're awesome too, Dave. Wanted to thank you for all the media you have showed. We are planning a movie right now, The UFO Connection, watch it with friends. Thank you for the heartfelt encouragement you express at the end of your videos. Keep it up, Dave. It means a lot to all the folks here. The villagers love you and Huck and Angie. Thank you. The card. Thank you. So, this is what they... This is what they sent. Squeaky thing for Huck. And a little doggy toy. Nice. Then they sent me and Angie some hot pads. Nice. 
And this one's the best. It says, not a dog toy, <laughs> but it's a Bigfoot with a cold head. And it is cold here in Montana, so you got to understand. Wow. So nice of you. So nice of you. And uh, I can't tell you enough how sweet you people are. Really nice. And uh, Angie and I talk about it all the time. All the time. So uh, thank you very, very much for your thoughts and the cards and the caring attitude that goes towards the village. So I got some uh, letters for you. So I have a, uh, I have a physician that writes to me all the time. And he has a lot of extreme ideas. But every once in a while he comes up with a good one. He says here, Dear Dave, sobering information. The New York Times and Wall Street Journal noted that drug overdose deaths have hit an all-time high. The U.S. recorded its highest number of drug overdose deaths in the last 12 months period, surpassing 100,000 in the first time in the shadow of the coronavirus, pan coronavirus pandemic, according to the CDC and prevention. Drugs are the number one killer of young people. This is equivalent to 274 deaths every single day of the year in a primary younger age group. There were an estimated 100,000 drug deaths in the 12 months running through April and the latest CDC data show. This marks a nearly 29% rise from deaths recorded in the same period of 2020, 93,300, indicating the U.S. is heading for another full year record with record deaths during COVID or post-COVID. The pandemic intensified opioid problems in many ways from increasing isolation among young people trying to maintain their sobriety. The pandemic has also been a major draw on resources and attention for public health authorities who are still trying to manage COVID-19. While we face a mental health crisis, opioid addiction is not a result of COVID, but only exacerbated because of our government not addressing opioid addiction scientifically. Dave, we know how to treat opioid addiction. The problem is a lack of will and ignorance to make treatment changes. Opio opioid addiction, like methamphetamine addiction, takes over the brain's receptors and willpower alone cannot prevent the craving. 12 steps alone is a failure. We have medications to quell the craving, but insurance, legal system, Medicaid, general attitudes, ignorance, and the desire to blame many different factors have diverted attention away from treatment. Most of the dying are young people, and if we don't do something to address this problem, we will lose a generation of individuals. I know that you blame COVID's effects on mental health access, but trust me, I've committed my life to treating addiction appropriately. This problem is different, and it has been building for more than a decade. One problem with that, suicides in non-addicted people are high, high, high up in the clouds. Specifically, I can only talk of right here in Montana, the young people that are taking their lives is COVID related. It's COVID related. How do I know that? This happened when they were out of school, they weren't addicted to anything, believe me. In fact, while China is an external direct threat, <clears throat> China has to keep sending fentanyl to the US and they will defeat our nation without shooting a gun. Even if we had a mental health provider for every single addict, it would not solve this problem because access to therapists is not the answer. Like you have missing people, I've studied this problem and I currently treat people and it will take a fundamental restructuring of current addiction treatment. Fentanyl is a nuclear bomb, and once an individual gets hooked, it is nearly impossible to reverse without proven treatment. Even with the COVID vaccine available so that we can loosening up on meetings and masking so that now groups can meet, reversing the addiction death rate can only be met through medical management, and that is why we have to institute a different approach immediately. That is the only way that stops opioid craving. I know that many people think that this is a matter of will, power, but in reality, a well-trained addiction treatment physician can take over control within 48 hours and manage the opioid addict before it is too late. Hard to believe, but absolutely true. I have treated thousands of opioid addicts successfully, and we have the approach, but ignorance is a difficult, ingrained belief system to counter. Trust me, if 
I had a child, a spouse that was addicted, I'd give it a shot because the alternative is death. And when you see the footage of these mentally challenged, physically challenged, drug-induced people laying on the sidewalks of our streets, it's an embarrassment that we call ourselves the United States of America. We have to be doing better for these people. We have to. Otherwise, we are going to lose a generation. Next letter. Hey, Dave, I just wanted to say that I saw all three of your missing 411 movies. They are wonderful. The movies made without a producing... For movies made without a producing company's help, they are truly amazing. Look, I'm following you for two years now on YouTube mainly. The documentaries helped me visualize better the sites and circumstances where people disappear. I think you've got it, Dave. With the man describing his abduction and missing 411, the UFO connection, and the elk transportation, the rest is just fill in the gaps with imagination. I can only imagine the work behind the documentaries, all the interviews, the trips taken to the scenes and meet the people. For me, the answer is there, that missing people are alien abductions. Others are predator victims. By predator, I mean Bigfoot and its transformation. About the trolls and the one-star reviews, some people want all the answers provided at the end of the movie. They aren't used to gathering info and making their own assumptions. Do you remember the quote from the X-Files? The truth is beyond us. I believe the truth is more than our mind can grasp and we can't handle the truth. Good job. You got something in you, the ambition, the hard work, the intuition, curiosity. In my country, we say something in the lines of, you are illuminated. Like you are gifted with a divine touch in order to fulfill a goal. Congratulations. I keep watching you as long as YouTube will keep posting. Finally, your son is proud of you. How couldn't he be? He is with you, in you, and beside you. You carry him with you in your heart, mind, and DNA. Kind regards from Romania. Keep it up. Thanks for being here. You know, sometimes I sit here, I think it's just me and the camera. And I don't think about the thousands of people out there that are watching, or how many different countries are watching. And all the little nooks and crannies and living rooms that I could get into and I could talk and discuss the, the world situation and missing people. It's a very much of a gift. And it's something that has to be treated with respect and dignity. And I hope I do. And I appreciate you all for being here. Thanks for being here from Romania. Next letter. Hey Dave, I wasn't going to report anything about this experience because it doesn't pertain to missing 411 subject, but on your January 8th video, one of your letters told of a man who was jogging just out, outside of town when he saw a strange light appear near him. As soon as I heard of what he observed, my ears perked up. He wondered if he had ever heard of his kind of experience and you replied no. Well, this may change that. I've since considered my event unusual, yet not startling. It was something I brushed off, but in the back of my mind, I've always wondered, what in the heck was that all about? Anyway, here's what happened. I, too, worked in law enforcement for almost 29 years. I'm now retired. Congratulations. You made it. I live in a rural but not isolated part of Essex County, southwest Ontario, Canada. One evening in, in mid-May, I went for a ride on a bicycle around 7.30. I ended up going a little further than planned, which resulted in getting back home later than planned. By the time I turned back on the stone road I live on, it was fairly dark, about 9.30. I was anxious to get home because, foolishly enough, I didn't have a light on my bike or person. Yet I could see the road clearly enough to ride safely. Stupid, I know. However, there was rarely traffic on this road, so it wasn't too worried. If a vehicle came, I'd simply dis dismount my bike and walk it until it passed. No vehicles came. As I was nearing the wooded entrance to my neighbor's driveway on my right, suddenly a fairly bright spotlight like with a diameter of about 20 feet turned on in front of me just inside the woods. My initial reaction was that someone was there and had turned on a big flashlight looking into the woods. But the light seemed too big, too round, and lit up too much of an area. It also appeared as if it could be coming from above. I thought I would see the silhouette of someone 
standing in front of the beam with a light in his hand, but no one was there. The light was on for about three seconds and abruptly shut off when I was right across from it. I kept looking but did not see or hear anyone. I know the people who live there, a retired police sergeant and his wife. At this time of the year, the trees were fairly bare and there wasn't much foliage to hide someone. It was easy to see through the woods. It struck me as very odd, but I kept on pedaling to get home. My house was about a quarter mile away. I didn't see the light again, but I kept looking over my shoulder. Yeah, I, I would have been too. <laughs> out of curiosity, the next day I drove to the same spot, spotted my, stopped my car, got out and looked through the trees and telephone poles to see if there was a safety light anywhere. There was none. I'm quite aware of UFOs and wished after the fact that I had looked up above me when I was riding. However, this is one of those strange occurrences where I didn't think of what I should have done until it was too late. I kept thinking, I wish I could run that one by me again, so it could be more attentive. So it remains that unfortunately by the time our minds turns on, something unusual happens. It abruptly ends leaving us thinking. I should have been more observant, frustrated, just leaves us wondering. Perhaps this is why the adage, expect the unexpected, is one we should live by. Maybe when we would be quicker to react accordingly. Just think how long it would take 9-11 disaster to collectively click in. Now the author of that letter you read knows that someone else has experienced something very similar. Thank you. That adage about kicking in and getting a second chance at something. It always goes right, by, right back to, and this is a Canadian policeman we're talking to here, it goes back to another Canadian guy, Les Stroud, survivor man. Les and I have worked together on projects before. The first movie I ever did, Missing 411, Les is in it. But uh, he was talking about a time he was filming a show, and he was filming a show actually about Bigfoot. And Les is, needless to say, quite the pessimist on the topic when he started and when he ended, he was a believer, I think. But in this one segment, he was alone in the middle of nowhere. He had somebody guide him in and said, you know, you gotta leave me alone. I don't want anyone to say somebody else played a part in this. He was on this very steep hillside, big valley below. And he went to sleep and he said, you know, I don't know why I woke up, I woke up, it's like 2.33 in the morning, and this big valley is in front of me. And I look out, and right at eye level, probably, you know, a thousand feet off the ground, even with my eye level, there's this standard UFO parked out there in the valley. He said, it wasn't a dream, because I knew what I was looking at. I couldn't believe it. And he says, now, do you know how many thousands of hours of film I've taken? And he goes, my mind never reached for that camera. He goes, it was the oddest thing in looking back at that. I never made a move for the camera. And so in the times that we talked about this, I asked him, I said, well, do you think maybe they had manipulated your mind so that you couldn't grab the camera or it was occupied so the mind couldn't even go there. He says, well, every intuition in me says to grab the camera, so I never even thought about it. So when this man says, well, I wish I could relive it, there's one part where Les Stroud wishes he could relive it and grab the camera, which was two feet away. So. Next letter. Hey Dave, your Dutch fan yesterday night watched the 411 UFO connection uh, on Amazon in German. I liked it very much and the inquisitive quality was as good as I expected and as always, it's great. Not only I put in a four star review, but I also remarked in the German language, which is my second language, the route to your first two documentaries. I was the first in the German language to do it. I hope this helped. Thank you. Another thing, and I don't usually do this, but tonight we have Canada that I've re read a letter from, Romania I've read a letter from, and now a person talking in German from the Netherlands. <laughs> you guys are great. I've got you all here. Uh, next one. Hey Dave, can't tell you how much I enjoyed your 
classes, Bigfoot classes. We don't see them down here in Florida that I know of, never heard about one anyway. You're the only person I can listen to on this subject. Can't stand the beating of the trees on the woods by those idiots who they never find anything. Thanks for the logical, factual information. Gonna have to read your books about Bigfoot now. Dave, I do not have Twitter. Refuse to put it on my devices. May have to rethink that now that there's a new owner. How much am I missing by not having Twitter? <laughs> well, since you asked. So, when I had Twitter, at the very beginning, I went from zero subscribers to like 27,000 in like four months. And then I sat between 27 and 30,000 for the next six years. Didn't really move at all. And then, in the last five months, I've gone from 30,000 to 40,000. <laughs> Twitter is entirely different than what you thought it was before. Uh, I think in the last five, six months, I've maybe had one hate email. Almost none. The, the topography's changed a lot. And they are letting on a lot that they never let on before. As an example, they called the Hunter Biden laptop Russian disinformation and anybody put anything on you got suspended. Well, that's not the way it is anymore. So just to let you know. So Twitter, David Politis at Can-Am Missing. I encourage you to go. I'm also on Truth Social, David Politis at Missing 411. Uh, and since we were just talking about Bigfoot, I'm going to be at the Great Florida Bigfoot Conference, April 22nd this year, 2023, in Ocala, Florida. And I'm going to be there with my one of my best, best buddies, Ron Moorhead. Great, great speaker. Super great guy. He and I made Missing 411 The Hunted together. And, uh, and also Jeff Meldrum will be there. That'll be fun. Next email. Hey, I've, Dave, I've been involved as an actor in major film production in several different capacities and have just received your new DVD. Your new documentary has absolutely hit a home run. Logical train of thought, sequence of events, timeline. Captivating, interesting interviews, great cinematography and editing, great questions. The work is finally something that is going to make an impact on the skeptics and disbelievers. You knocked it out of the park. Thank you for doing the work and I'm interested in and work with needs to be done. The real reality has been and is hidden from us and you are making a crack in the armor of disinformation. Glad to support your phenomenal work. Thank you. Greatly appreciated, especially coming from somebody in the industry. It means a lot. Next letter. Hey Dave, good morning. I've been watching the new season of Unsolved Mysteries. And last night I came across an episode titled Mystery at Mile Marker. If you haven't seen it, this episode recounts the mysterious death of a 16-year-old girl. She passed away as a result of being struck by a train one night after getting into an argument with her parents and storming out the front of her home. Her death to close, two close friends and a family was unbelievably ruled a suicide. I'm bringing this to your attention because some of the details in her case match several of the 411 profiles, and I'm curious now if you've ever come across it. Here are some of the profile points. Her residence, place of disappearance, and location of the train impact are all located within dense forest topography. Not a profile point. Police found her body without shoes, socks, shirts, shoes, all of which is confirmed to be wearing when she was first left her house. So if you get hit by a train, <coughs> it's going to knock you right out of your shirt, uh, shoes, for sure. After the family reviewed her father's game camera footage the day after her death, her shoes, shirts, and socks are found several days after she passed away, located two miles from the body. That's weird. They appear to have been intentionally placed where she was found. Her shorts are never located. Her feet and shoes are clean and don't show any signs of walking any long distance. Parents and neighbors have seen on the game camera leaving their house only two minutes behind her as they attempted to locate her. She was afraid of the dark and her parents don't believe she'd go out in the woods by herself at night. There's a lot, so far, none of those things match our profile because in a logical way, she was hit by the train or hit by a car, it's gonna knock you out of your shoes. 
There's no logical explanation on how she traveled the distance between her home and the train tracks without shoes or socks. Well, unless the camera at the house showed she wasn't wearing shoes, then in my guesstimate, she was wearing the shoes when she left the house. The train engineer couldn't confirm whether or not he saw her prior to the impact. She's a very unique girl to both her and her family in general, being 6'3", tall, blue eyes, blonde hair, very intelligent, outstanding athlete. The full episode is available on YouTube if interested in watching it. So, there's a lot to these things that you got to dig further than that. A lot of you have made comments about cases that are going on currently around the world. Um, I don't like to make comments on cases that are new. Now, once police give up their search, that's a different story. But as long as searchers are on scene, I don't want to say anything and I don't want to do anything that may impact them leaving. That would be viewed as detrimental by the family. So I don't want to say anything. I'd rather let it play out, let them do their thing, and then after they give up and let the dust settle, then I'll make a few comments. But it's also very difficult in other countries to understand what really happened because they usually won't release the reports. And when you don't understand what they've done, the police, what they haven't done, what friends and family have told them about the victim, you know, maybe privately people have said, yeah, the person was suicidal, but they didn't want their parents to know. Or, you know, maybe they had a bad relationship with their significant other and they didn't want other people to know. Or maybe they were having an affair or whatever. A lot of things come out when those interviews that you will never know because you'll just see whatever the newspaper wants you to see. That's the reason. So if you don't see me commenting, don't get angry. Just be patient. I'm very, very by the book, let's say. I don't want to, don't want to rock the boat too much. Okay? So, I'm talking about two cases. And these two cases, very odd. One case you've probably heard of if you've read my books. The other case you've never heard of because I've never talked about it. First case involves a, a very seasoned hunter, 42 years old, Edward Young, who went missing October 15th, 1947. He was a potato farmer from McDowell, California, and that's way up north of Mount Shasta, between Mount Shasta and the Oregon border. Uh, let, me, let me talk to you a little bit about this part of the country because I've spent a lot of time there. My friends, or my family and I used to vacation in a spot right next to Mount Shasta called Dunsmere. Dunsmere was a place right on the Sacramento River. And back then the Sacramento had really good fishing. And uh, we'd go up there with uh, our aunts and uncles and rent a couple cabins and spend a week up there swimming and fishing in the Sacramento. It was like 100 degrees, people jumping in the river next to you and you're still catching fish. It was a phenomenal place. A lot of great memories. And then we used to travel all around Shasta in the meantime, if it got too hot in the late afternoon to fish or whatever. So I've been all around Shasta, all around McLeod, Bernie, McDowell, uh, Wairika, all of that area. Know it very, very well. I made a, a show, a two-hour special for the History Channel called Vanished. Vanished was part of the show, a good part of it. It dealt with a series of disappearances on Mount Shasta. Well, when I say location is a cluster zone, I don't mean just that little mountain. I mean, there's a radius there and everything that's affected by that mountain where there's missing people is in that cluster zone. And both of these cases are in that cluster zone. So Ed Young, 42 years old, went missing October 15th, 47, potato farmer, had a wife at home who was pregnant with their baby, and he went out deer hunting with a friend named Ola Green. 
the men drove to a place called the Whaleback. And the Whaleback is a big mountain, maybe half the size or a little more than half the size of Mount Shasta. And it's just uh, east of Mount Shasta, not far. And the men were hunting the north side of the Whaleback. So here, here's Mount Shasta, right here, 14,100 and some change. And this is the Whaleback, a little over 8,000 and change. And the distance between the summits is eight miles, which in relative terms is nothing. So let's talk about Ed for a little bit. Ed was your consummate, experienced outdoorsman. Didn't need anybody with him. Knew the outdoors like you know your backyard. Hunted his whole life. Expert with a firearm. Carried a 300 Savage rifle. Knocked down anything out there in the woods. There was a lot of bear in this area. A lot of deer. And a lot of spookiness. Because that's what comes with Shasta. Well... He and his buddy Ola drove to the Whaleback, got out early in the morning, and they started to walk around the mountain. At about 11 o'clock, they decided to split up and hunt, point of separation. Ola says that they had an agreement to meet back at 4 o'clock at the car, and as he was walking back to the car, he heard some yells up on the mountain that he couldn't say for sure if they were Ed or not, but he heard somebody yelling. Well, he yelled back. He didn't get a response. He waited at the car for a couple hours. And then Ola went to the Hebron Ranger Station and con contacted U.S. Forest Service Ranger C.A. Abel, A-B-E-L-L. -L. Abel immediately called the Siskiyou County Sheriff, Ben Richardson, and started to get some resources up to the whaleback. Now, the whaleback, like I said, is an unusual place. It's there's a lot of flat between the base of Shasta till the whaleback starts to come up again. A lot of woods. But then once you get on the whaleback, not a lot up there. Except on the side of the mountain, there's some. Well, the night of the 15th, the night that Ed went missing, the night that he went missing, it started to snow really hard. And the sheriff went up there along with other uh, Forest Service personnel, and they were looking for fires, or they were listening for gunshots. They didn't see any fires, didn't hear any gunshots. Well, they knew that Ed was young, in really, really good shape, expert with a rifle, knew the, ha knew the outdoors, and weren't really that scared of what might happen. The next day, a small crew from the Forest Service and the Sheriff's Department showed up, walked around, yelled, shotguns, and they, and they all felt at that point that Ed was going to just walk out. Well, on the 17th, things got a little more serious. They had 50 people there. And again, nothing was found. The 18th, three days into the search, all of the lumber mills in Siskiyou County and Shasta County North were closed down, and 250 searchers went to the whaleback, organized by... Richardson and Abel into groups and they searched the Whaleback Mountain. And that was a monumental effort. So, eight miles between mountains, elevation of the Whaleback, 8,535 feet, Shasta, 14,100. Well, at about this time, the Forest Service decides that they're going to work with Siskiyou County to bring some bloodhounds in. And they were searching a four-square-mile area, two by two. 
And on the 20th, they brought in two bloodhounds, two planes, helicopters, and they started crisscrossing the sky looking for Ed. Weren't finding anything. Well, on the 20th of October, they brought in a special bloodhound named Patsy, 20 months old, had found a lot of people. And the handler had the dog lay and sleep on Ed's clothing all night. I've never heard of this. Well, the next day, Patsy was the first one out the door with the handler and they were looking for Ed. They held everyone else back and then later that afternoon, they let him go in where Patty had already gone over. It was during this time, about the 19th of, December, of October, that Ed's brother, E.R. Young, from Orland in the San Joaquin Valley, had been there and was helping in the search for his brother. E.R. was also a hunter, also an outdoorsman. Couldn't believe what was happening and knew his sister-in-law was just a wreck and was pregnant with Ed's kid. On the October 24th to the 28th, multiple dog teams went over cold, wet, fog-shrouded ground. And there were many mentions of the fog inhibiting searchers. On October 29th, uh, Ed's friends offered a $500 reward on October 30th, two more new dogs arrived. And then on November 1st, it started to snow. And on November 2nd, it started to snow really bad. And eventually the Siskiyou County Sheriff called off the search because it was too dangerous. It's a really, really hard thing to do to call off because everyone knows that means they're dead. It's a debilitating hit. It's a gut punch to the family. So Ed disappeared on October 15th, 47. June 6th, 1950, almost two and a half years later, his family reinitiated a $500 reward to find Ed, which caused several hundred people to go up into the mountains that summer and look. His 300 Savage rifle and Ed's clothing, none of it, nothing was ever found. Very strange. Very strange. Um, I can tell you that in conversations I've had with different Native American tribes about Mount Shasta in that region, certain parts of Mount Shasta they won't go on. And certain parts of that valley are considered sacred and don't go on. Now that area that Ed was hunting in, that area just north of there, there's places where the deer hunting is known to be fantastic. But there was never any gunshots heard, like Ed was in distress. But there was just one voice heard yelling for help, which Ola never really knew who it was. But if you've been here many times, you know, you know that people calling for help can sometimes be in areas where you can't see them. I'm sure Ola was haunted for a lifetime and I'm sure that Ed's child grew up never knowing who his dad was. And that would have been a tough, tough existence for Ed's wife with no husband and a new baby. So that story about Ed Young is a new story. We just found it within the last couple months. But as we're reading and doing the research on that story, right away to the front of our minds came another story that we had already written about. It was in the books. And it was stunningly close to what I just told you. And that is the story of Jerry Lee McKeon. Jerry, a good old boy, 48 years old, disappeared on Medicine Lake Road, Medicine Lake McLeod, California. Just a little east of where Ed disappeared, not far. 
And guess what Jerry did for work? Potato farmer. And he was a potato farmer in Merrill, Oregon, just a couple miles north of the California border in Oregon. He spent a lifetime living on the family farm. It's what he loved to do. He was single, took care of his parents. He was decided he was described as quiet, trustworthy, hard worker, outstanding, underlying, outstanding hunter. And to that outstanding hunter point, in doing the background on this, I couldn't believe what I found. So Jerry disappeared September 21st, 2002. Remember something I said to you before? If I put two cases of almost identical people disappearing within a couple years of each other in almost the same place, people are going to talk. Hey, remember that guy who disappeared a couple years ago? Wasn't he this and that? Yeah, that's right. But if I spread it out by 30, 40 years, people retire, people forget, people don't remember. But I remember. So during the background for Jerry's story, February 24th, 2000, there was an article in the Las Vegas Sun magazine. And I'm not even sure how I found this, but it had to do with Jerry. And you go, wait a minute, this is the same guy who's missing. That's right. Well, Jerry, again, being one of the best hunters anywhere, decided to go after elk in the middle of Nevada. Friends, there's nothing in the middle of Nevada. Tonopah, there's uh, a military base there. And that's about it. Well, about 20 miles north of Tonopah, in the middle of the Nevada region, Jerry went elk hunting because he had heard from friends that the elk were big. You got to really pay the price. You got to hike a lot. You got to be in great shape. And Jerry said, hey, I'm single. I'm in good shape. Farm's okay. I can take time off, go elk hunting. So during uh, 1999, during the hunting season in October, he went out there and the article explained that Jerry was bow hunting and he bagged one of the biggest elk in the history of Nevada. And the game wardens came to look at it. Everybody came to look because it was so huge. It was in the record books. So when I read this, I thought, it really tells me something about this guy. Because being an elk hunter is different than any other kind of hunting. Uh, because so many people disappear elk hunting. Did you watch the movie? Maybe you need to watch the movie. That, coupled with bow hunting, wow. Now that's a lot, because there's a lot of bow hunters that disappear. Well, this story starts September 21st, 2002, and Jerry left his family residence in Merrill, and he told him he was going hunting for the day, and he drove his GMC pickup with a Honda 185 motorcycle in the bed. And what was funny about that is when my dad and I were young, my dad had a little motorcycle. He got me a little Honda 90, tra Honda Trail 90. And we would cruise around everywhere looking for fishing spots in the middle of nowhere. That's what Jerry had. He had a 185. And that's when he went as far as he could in the truck, he'd jump on the motorcycle and go. So he took off. He didn't say exactly where he was going to go, but he didn't, he didn't really care because he knew he'd be okay. But Jerry didn't return that night. And the, his relatives tried to call the sheriff and they said, no, we're not gonna take a report until he's three days overdue, which isn't the truth anymore. But on September 25th, the family filed a missing persons report. And then farmers and friends in the entire area stopped doing their harvest work and everybody pitched in and took an area to search for Jerry. His truck was found a long, several days later in an area east of Mount Shasta, uh, right near what's called the Doorknob Snow Park 
near Medicine Lake. Now, the important part here is Jerry's keys were in a part of the truck that he normally hid them in, indicating to all of his friends this was an area that he parked in to hunt. Now, let's talk about that. So, this is Ed. Ed lived in McDool, took the truck down here with his friend, and he hunted the whale back. This is Mount Shasta. Very close. Eight miles, point to point. Now, this is the California border up here. Jerry lived in Merrill, potato farmer, like Ed, and he came down to the snow park right near Medicine Lake, which is right here, to hunt. Now, even though the distance is an hour and 48 minutes and 72 miles, it's really the way the crow flies, about 20 miles from point where Ed disappeared to the point, point where Ed disappeared to the point where Jerry disappeared. And here's Shasta right here. So all of this area is under that influence of that mountain, trust me. Well, they find the truck, they find the keys. Everything seems to make sense that he obviously went out hunting right there. So the Siskiyou sheriffs get in there, Forest Service gets in there, and they get 70 searchers, and they get two dog teams, four planes, and the Siskiyou County Sheriff even got a helicopter from the Highway Patrol and they started to cover that area like a blanket. And I've been to this area before because when I wrote this article, I wanted to see it. And what it reminded you of is high ground cover, no giant trees, really a lot of, very few. Uh, it would have been pretty tough hunting because you had to find an opening to get, find, see an animal and to hit it. But one of his friends, were interviewed for an article and his friend said that we're not really worried about Jerry because we know anything that happens out there that he's faced with he's gonna be fine remember how everyone said the same thing about Ed they almost sound like the same personality it's the same kind of people well Siskiyou County gave him five days on the search they found nothing And his relatives were scorched. They couldn't believe it. I mean, they were getting, they were older people. Jerry really ran the farm. And without him, they were devastated. The family posted a $20,000 reward. And it's been, you know, 21 years. No one's ever found him. His bow and arrow, nothing. But here's what I want you to think about. So, Ed Young, 42 years old. Jerry McKeon, 48 years old. Ed Young, no kids. Jerry, no kids. Ed, potato farmer. Jerry, potato farmer. Ed, deer hunting. Jerry, deer hunting. The people that described Ed's ability in the woods and his ability as a hunter were almost exactly the same words to describe Jerry. Nothing could stop him, weren't afraid of anything, could handle anything they faced, had decades of experience in the woods, lived a life of hunting, on and on and on. So they're, higher, they're hunting essentially the same landscape 20 miles apart. They lived in essentially the same area, about 15 miles apart. Both men were never found. Here's what I want you to think about. The way we do these cases is I profile them, meaning I look for similar points in each of the cases. Profile points canines, weather, what they're doing, their background. It almost seems like somebody is profiling 
the victims here. Because the profile of Edward Young and the profile of Jerry McKean are dead on the same people, just years apart. 1947 and 2002, 55 years. I've never ever heard of this case regarding Ed Young. I've heard of Jerry's case. That's why I wrote about it. But when we put these two cases together, it really takes on a whole new meaning. And this isn't the first time this has happened. Of course, it's happened many other times. But it's important to understand how similar these can be without a lot of effort. I know some people say, oh, there's nothing spooky here. People just disappeared. <laughs> oh, or, you know, this really isn't that unusual. Really? If you watch this movie, The UFO Connection, or you watch Missing 41 The Hunted, then hopefully you've seen the sheriffs interviewed. And what do they say? It is very unusual not to find somebody. It is very unusual to have the canines not pick up a scent trail. Their words, not mine. So, I thank you very much for being here. Please share this on your social media. Please make sure right now you're subscribed to our channel. And leave a comment if you'd like. Give me a thumbs up if you like the video. And in the list right below this, sometimes these are preloaded to go up at a certain time in the morning. And if I'm not home or I'm not up early, I can't get to it to add a comment until the video goes public. So I usually get there sometime around 8 or 8.30 and I'll post the, uh, the comment. But you'll find under the comment section, the number one pinned comment, you'll see a bunch of links to our videos and our store. Please, please do not buy our books at eBay, Amazon, etc. You're going to get ripped off. People charging three, four, five times as much. Come to our store, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Come to our store and buy our books for $24.99. And you can watch the movie online, if you wish, at Amazon, iTunes, and Vimeo in almost every country. And uh, if you want DVDs or Blu-rays, and I know a lot of people do for their collection, I have a good collection, we sell the Blu-rays and DVDs. So just go to nabigfootsearch.com. Missing Persons website, canammissing.com, like canadianamericanmissing.com. And I told you about Twitter. Follow me there. Thank you for being here. This is the Can Am Missing Project YouTube page. We have over 450 videos. Click in, click the little Can Am Missing logo on the bottom left of the screen. That'll take you to another screen. Then click on the videos on that screen. That'll take you to all the videos. And you can watch them for days. But uh, thanks for being here. Be nice to somebody today when you see them. I don't care who it is. Somebody grumpy on the street. Hey, how you doing? Make their day. Make them smile. Help them with their packages if they drop something or hold the door open for someone. Something small. All right. You have a great day. Politis out.